thank you very much. Um, it is nice to be appreciated and to, to be thanked, so I, I don't say that lightly. I, that's one of the things I always uh, throw in the message, that you got to encourage people and whatnot. So thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate your prayers, because on some of those tough days and difficult days, I have notes that people write me that I save. I encourage you to have a, have a file system um, for encouragement, because we also have a file system for negativity. It's called our brain. Um, we have no problem pulling that up. Um, on a regular basis. And so you need those notes and texts and messages of encouragement. And so I'm so thankful to all of you. Um, and I'm so thankful to the children in the church. I'm glad that they know who I am. Uh, that helps add to my uh, job tenure um, stability, I guess, long term, right? But thank you so much. But why don't we get down to business? I want to invite you to take out your teaching outlines as we are continuing our message series on sowing and reaping. And I guess today I'm, I'm really uh, reaping a lot of blessings. We're so thankful to have both Jen and Candace up here and say those wonderful things and, and your uh, generous applauses. But uh, life is without question governed by this law of whatever you sow, you are going to reap and vice versa. You are ultimately reaping what you're sowing. And today's message subject matter comes from a particular parable that is very relevant to our day and age. And in many ways, it's almost something that needs to be adopted in every educational system, every business practice, every psychological uh, ministry or medical approach that we take to people, because one of the follies of mankind from the beginning of time centers around the area of greed. And so uh, today is one of those prohibitive sowing and reaping messages, and it's this, sow greed reap dissatisfaction. Could you say that with me? Sow greed, reap dissatisfaction. Now, you don't need to be a multimillionaire to be greedy. Anybody could be greedy, and we're going to see that in just a moment. Uh, greed is something that the Bible says to be aware of, to stay, stay clear of, because greed will bring nothing but unfulfillment. It will bring disappointment, and it will certainly reap dissatisfaction in our life. Um, the Bible makes very clear that the greatest things in life are not things. But the society that we live in tells us the opposite. And so what we must realize that God has something to say about this because a lot of our peace um, that is being robbed today comes from having the wrong pursuits in life. And so if we could be very clear that we need to steer clear of sowing greed, we will then reap satisfaction, not dissatisfaction. So I want to invite you to turn me in your Bibles. Uh, we're going to stay in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at the parable of the rich fool. And so, uh, you know, you never want to be called a fool in life. The F word in the Bible is not something you want to be called. Um, and a fool means to be an ignorant, mindless person. And we're going to see um, why this person who had a great wealth, extreme wealth, is labeled as such. Uh, but we're going to get a little bit of context first because the parable is going to be given um, in response to a question that is posed to Jesus. And so it starts off in Luke chapter 12 by saying this, someone from the crowd said to him, now that's Jesus because Jesus is in the midst of teaching. And he says, teacher, now you go ahead and circle that. Yeah, that's a term of respect uh, or rabbi, your translation might say, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, before we go any further, this is utterly ridiculous. He's in the middle of teaching, and somebody interrupts him, and they want him to settle a family problem. I mean, what does this guy think? This is the Jerry Springer show for crying out loud. I mean, he's calling out, and hey, could you do this and bring my brother over here? Well, wait a minute. Jesus is teaching. This request is very rude, and Jesus has not come to be an arbitrator. He's not come to be somebody who settles these types of matters. And listen to Jesus' response. Friend, uh, you could circle that. Uh, that could also mean mister or man. He said, who appointed me judge or arbitrator over you? You know, I'm here doing the father's business here. You have a problem with your brother. And even by the way of his request, it tells us that the brother is in the audience. The brother is there. And he's not necessarily looking for Jesus to judge it fairly. It's just, hey, tell my brother to do what I want you to do, basically. And, and that's not the type of request that Jesus is going to, to adhere to or fulfill. Again, he's not a genie. 
Um, he's Jesus. And so it goes on to say here, he then told them a parable. Now it says he then told them a story. And this is what he told them. Listen to this. Watch out and be on guard against all greed. Can we say that together? Watch out and be on guard against all greed. Now go ahead and circle the phrase, watch out. It means to beware. It means to pay special attention. It means that it's something that we need to recognize. It's something we need to be on, we need to be on high alert with. Uh, it, because if we're not careful, greed can contaminate us so much so that it can literally lead to death. So it says, watch out, be on guard. Now the word guard means to, to look out. It means to fortify, to secure. So be on guard against, now notice this, all greed. Now, not some greed, not just money greed, all greed. You could be greedy with food. You could be greedy with your time. You could be greedy with your talents. And of course, you could be greedy with your money. So uh, be on guard against all greed. Now, the word greed in the Greek language means to have an unhealthy desire for something. Maybe you have that today. Maybe that has gotten you into trouble in the past. I think that would be true of everybody's testimony here today in one way or the other that we had an unhealthy desire for something. Now, uh, let's just be playful here and talk about an unhealthy desire. I used to have an unhealthy desire for ding-dongs and ring-dings. Anybody else have that? Okay. You got to be careful with those things. Yeah, they might look good, um, but it's not very healthy for you. Yes, the cream, and sometimes you get one with extra cream, and then you take that to other things. Oreos, double-stuffed Oreos. I saw something the other day, it said, a mega stuffed Oreo. I mean, it's, it's out of control. And uh, we know that those types of things, we can have a desire for them, but just because we have a desire for mega stuffed Oreos doesn't mean it's healthy. And uh, that is a, a very surface level example, but on and on you go for other things. You know, we think just because we have an itch, we got to scratch it in life. Just because everybody's doing it, I got to do it. Words that people live by, but words that you could die by if you're not careful. So the Bible says, be careful, beware, if you will, of all types of greed. And we need to keep an understanding of that in our forefront. Now listen to what Jesus says here. Because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Sadly enough, there's a lot of religion out there today making a mint, I might add, on telling people that you equate your spiritual maturity and your significance to by, by how much you get. Do you realize that that is the polar opposite of the teachings of Jesus? Jesus determines greatness by not how much you get, but by how much you give. And heaven will value life on that metric. To think any other way is not only heresy, uh, but also a brand of teaching that comes from the pits of hell. You know, when people are going to rob and deceive people, they don't tell them, hey, I'm going to steal your bank account information, and then I'm going to rob you tomorrow night when you're sleeping. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Nobody does that. Somebody's going to rob your home. They don't send you a note in the mail and say, I'm going to come when you're away. Even though you're going to have timers on and your alarm on, I've already figured out how to get in. Nobody's going to do that. And the same thing is true with people who fancy themselves as Bible teachers and preachers and so forth and on, whenever somebody harps on possessions and prosperity and possessions and prosperity, that's not the gospel. The gospel says very clearly that that's not how you value life. And Jesus is saying it right here. And Jesus goes as far as to say, beware. That's what that means in the Greek language. Watch out. Watch out. Beware. you got to be careful because this is why. See, if you want to stay away from, remember we're teaching about sowing and reaping. If you don't want to sow greed, okay, write this first principle down. Beware of being possessed by my possessions and pleasures. Can you say that with me? Beware of being possessed by my possessions and pleasures. No, that is going to hurt people when they're controlled that way. When we are possessed by what we're trying to get or what we already have. And I throw possessions and pleasures in the same box. We need to be careful. Ecclesiastes 6.9 says it this way, it is better to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else. I mean, the Bible reads really like a psychology book when you flip through the pages, doesn't it? 
You know, the greatest mental reasoning, the greatest strategy for success in living comes from the Word of God. When you look at, and I've read a lot of business books, a lot of business books really have biblical principles and they, they just word things differently. God wrote the book on life success. And what's interesting is, is that life success is not how everybody else says it is. That the success of life is, the satisfaction of life is found in being content and taking a reckoning of what God has already given to you. Now, go and keep striving for greatness, but don't be possessed by your possessions, Jesus says. Here comes this man saying, I want what my brother has divided up fairly. He doesn't even give a reckoning of what's going on. Jesus, the master teacher, responds because Jesus knows what's in people's hearts, and he sees that the motivation for this man's request for Jesus to basically be his arbitrator, his Maury Povich, his Jerry Springer, his Dr. Phil, he sees the motivation is simply out of greed, and so he gives him, and he gives you and I, for that matter, this parable on greed. We have to be careful, even with our prayers and our request of Jesus, that it's not out of selfishness like this man. We have to be careful that we're not being possessed by our selfish pursuits like this man. Nevertheless, God's word continues over and over again. Another example could be found in the prophet Habakkuk's book. Uh, As God was giving basically a diatribe to the Chaldean people, this is what God said, in their greed they have collected many nations, but like death and hell, they are never satisfied. Notice that. When you are controlled by greed, you will never be satisfied. You know, it's kind of like drinking salt water. The more salt water you drink, the thirstier you get. That's exactly how the pursuit of greed is. God wants us to keep our eyes on that. He wants us to keep our focus away from the things of possessions and more focused on his purposes. Hebrews 13.5 zeroes in on money here. It says, keep your life free. And why don't we say it together from the top? Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Interestingly enough, the Gospel of Luke, which gives us this great parable, what's right after it? The cure for anxiety. And it talks about possessions. It talks about needs. A lot of times we're controlled by our possessions because it represents a trust not in God. And God ties it together. Keep your life free from the love of money. Uh, It tells us, Paul told Timothy, that the, the root of all evil is what? The love of money. Money's not evil. Money's neutral. Talents are not evil. Talents are neutral. Your time isn't evil. It's neutral. It's when we mismanage it and use it for selfish means. It could get us into trouble. You know, if I asked everybody today, which I'm not, but if I asked everybody today, which, if you had one wish, what would it be? How many of us would say today to be wealthy? You know, if I could just be rich. How many of you heard of the minus touch? You know, you ever hear that saying in business? He's got the minus touch. Uh, That comes from Greek mythology. Uh, King Minus had helped somebody out who had the power to grant wishes. And after he helped them out, the the person said, you've helped me so much, uh, King Minus, if, if just name, name it and I'll give it to you. If you have one wish, what is it? And he said, well, I've, like anybody, a lot of people, what he wanted, incredible wealth, incalculable wealth. And so he said, I want everything I touch to be able to be turned to gold. Granted, and he was able to have it. So he would touch a stick, it would become gold. He touched a brick, it would be able to turn gold. That's a nice problem, I guess, right? But not so fast. His greed got the best of him. It wasn't such a great request at all. He went to eat, and they put an apple in front of him. He touched the apple. It turned to gold. He bit it and broke his gold teeth, okay? So that wasn't too good. And so forth on, everything he touched. He went to go to bed. He touched the bed, and and, and it would turn to gold, and it wasn't very comfortable. And then worst of all, he went to hug his children as they went to jump in his lap, and as soon as he touched them, they turned to gold. He then begged for this to be taken away from him because no longer was this touch uh, what he needed it to be because it became something that he used for selfishness as he accumulated a lot of wealth, not just sticks and bricks, but he touched so many other things. But then everything else he touched became useless to him. And he found out that it wasn't such a good request at all. And so he sought out the man who granted his wish and he asked with all of his heart, 
for this blessing that he really thought was a blessing but turned into a curse to be taken away. How many of us sit here today and uh, we're like that? You know, we want this certain ability. We want this certain wealth. Beware of what you wish for. The better focus is, is to focus on God because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is what we need to zero in on today. What you sow is what you reap. If you sow greed, you will reap the dissatisfaction that comes from not having the peace of God in your life. If you're sowing a greediness after pleasure, I, you know what? I, I, got, I have to do this with my body. I got to go here. I got to do this. I got to live my life this way. Uh, this is how I think I got to be. You could do that. You have free will. But is that God's best? Oh, but this verse, if I say it this way, if I say it that way, here's a bottom line principle. We're called to live for the glory of God. That's what we're called to do. And I don't care how young or old you are right now. If you miss anything, don't miss that. The best use of your life, no matter who you are, is to say, I want to live for God's honor and glory. Not I want to do what feels good, what I think is good, what society says is good. Because the last time I checked, when I looked deep inside of me, it wasn't pretty. Don't look to within for the guidance of your life. Look above, look upward to God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But if you're chasing after every pleasure, every possession of this life, you will have more discontentment. You know, King Midas got his wish to touch everything to go. You know, we're getting, you know, a lot of times when we're pursuing things, we're getting our wish. But how's that working out for us? It's more dissatisfaction. And when it comes to the blessings God gives us anyway, they're for his purpose and use. Write this second principle down. God positions me with blessings to be a blessing. Can you say that with me? God positions me with blessings to be a blessing. God doesn't bless you and I that we just kind of hoard it for ourselves. And now here comes this parable that he's going to give to us. He's going to tell us, watch out for being greedy. And now he's going to give another Aragorean-type parable, which is another land parable about sowing and reaping, about farmers. Now, as I've said before when we've talked about farmers, uh, I don't know anybody here on Staten Island that has like a one-acre farm. Does anybody have that? Okay. We barely have grass in front of our house, okay? We understand that. But to these people, farming was the ultimate illustration. It was the ultimate way of being a trader. It was the ultimate way of being a business person. Many, many, many jobs were to be had for people who worked on land and farming. If there ever was an illustration that could resonate with people, it was these, these farming illustrations of sowing and reaping. And that's why a lot of the parables center, center around this. In fact, the very first parable of Jesus talks about sowing and reaping. But here we go again. He then told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. Now, let's just say what's not here. In no way is this man dishonest. We get no clue of that. Because a lot of times when people are wealthy, we're like, oh, they're cheating, they're scheming. Not so. I've met very wealthy people in my lifetime who would devout in their faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, using what God gave them for the glory of God, yet still very connected to their church. In fact, missionaries, ministries, like you saw Operation Christmas Child, all these things would be, would be impossible to do without money. Money is very important in God's kingdom if used properly, like everything else. And so this illustration here doesn't tell us that this man is evil. He's not. His focus is off. It says a rich man's land was very productive. Now, verse 17, we get an inside look into this man's soul and his heart and his mind. He thought to himself, now anybody that talks to himself like this has a problem, okay? Listen to this. What should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this. I got an idea. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Now, notice how many personal pronouns are here. I counted eight. You might count more. He's very me-centric, very focused on himself right now. That's a formula for dissatisfaction. You will be very unhappy in your life if all you ever do is focus on yourself. In fact, you will get yourself into trouble. It will become something that will imprison your mind and your heart. 
It will prohibit you from moving forward when all you're consumed with is getting yours. I talked last week about a famous and popular hashtag, doing me. Beware of that. Beware of having a hashtag in your life that is selfish. Beware of being self-consumed. Because live by this principle. God positions me in life with blessings so that I can be a blessing. He doesn't position us that we can build bigger and better and forget everybody else. Because notice, God isn't mentioned anywhere in his little self-talk. Neither is anybody else. No family. No friends. I've heard different stories of this illustration, but I came across a, a, a newer version, if you will. And it was of a man who had extreme wealth. And a local church wanted to fund a project they were doing to send children uh, resources overseas. They were going to have a mission trip, people to go over there. It was going to include medical missions, people who were in the medical field, uh, nurses and doctors. It was going to include people who were skilled uh, with building, any, any type of use they had with their hands. So people signed up for that. And then they had people who can manage projects. Large, they had, so it was a, a, a widespread group that was going to go and help minister and take resources uh, to an impoverished place around the world. And so uh, they reached out to this man in town who had incredible wealth. And so they said to him, uh, this is what's going on. They sent him the literature. And he then responded because they, they kept reaching out to him. And he said, listen, I know that I'm on your docket to be someone who can give a lot. He goes, but do you know that I have a sister who's a widow with three kids? Do you know that I have a father who is in an assisted living home who requires, in addition to the staff, his own personal nurse that has to be funded out of private funds? And the guy into the phone is dumbfounded. No, no, I didn't know this. And he goes, do you know that I have two sons um, who live across the country, and they're pursuing degrees right now with very hefty education bills. He said, I, I didn't know that. And he said, okay, you don't know that. Now, if I don't help them, what makes you think I'm not going to help you, okay? God has blessed us to be a blessing. God has called you and I to use whatever he's given to us. And the question to ask yourself is, what's in my hands? What has God put in my reach? I don't need to hit the lotto to serve God. It's, it's whatever God has given to me, I'm going to use for his glory. What did God say to Abraham? Remember Abraham's story? Uh, we know it well that God would bless Abraham, Father Abraham, and he would be the father of a great nation. But prior to all the blessings unfolding, what did God say to Abraham? Look what it says as you flip over your notes. In Genesis 12, 2, why don't we say this together? As if God is saying it to you and I. Together. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Notice the purpose of it. God blesses people to be a blessing. And God often takes people out of obscurity. That's how he works. See, a lot of times, you know, uh, we, you know, if this celebrity could become a Christian, if this athlete could become a Christian, that's how people talk. I was laughing the other day. I was listening to the Christian radio station as they were in the middle of, of another telethon for funds. And they were, they were you know, can we play a song? And when, you can, when they play a song, could, do we have to play music that's not Christian? You know, just maybe we could play Christian music because it's a Christian radio station. Just a thought. I'm not a businessman. I'm just throwing that out there. And I listened to the host. They were going gaga goo goo over a, a celebrity who's in the music business who wrote on his Instagram page how hard life is and going on and lamenting. Um, and the radio host was talking about, now we know about hardships. Let me tell you something. This person they were talking about, uh, they have more sneakers than probably everybody in this room has today. Okay? Let's, we don't need a, we don't need a, thank God for celebrities getting saved, but we don't need a celebrity to get saved to tell us about hardships or holiness or anything in between. Uh, blessing is not for notoriety. Blessing is for his renown. And any celebrity or politician or athlete, anybody that's in the public light who does come to Christ, they're legitimate when they give God the glory and they're not posting about themselves. They're posting about God. And it's vital that we understand it that way. I heard the story about a young man Pascal, 
Um, and he was an influential French scientist who lived in the 1600s. At the age of 11 years old, he was already deemed a mathematical genius. He came up with many of the theories, the mathematical theories that uh, children study today. Um, before geometry was even known to its full extent, um, he, was, he, was, he mastered it. He also gave us the buses. He's the one that came up with the bus system. Um, we found out in 1662, uh, he founded the first bus company. Now, in addition to all of his brilliance and all of his ingenuity, he was a devout believer in Jesus Christ. But he realized something about his faith and his brilliance. He was mastering in the understanding of the word of God, but what he saw was, was that it's possible for even a person of faith to become so individualistic that they're, they're blessed by God, but they're always focused on themselves, even their knowledge of God's word. And so he quickly wrote down this memoir that he would be a minister to the poor. And he used everything he had, all of his wealth, all of his fame to care for the poor. He even sold his nice couch to use for money to give to the poor. The story says that when Pascal died at the age of 39 on August 19th, 1662, his funeral was attended by friends, family, scientific colleagues, worldly companions, converts, writers, and what filled the church was the poor. All the people that in one way or the other that were touched by Pascal, and he was dubbed Pascal to the poor. What's your heart for? There are some people that are called to minister to the poor, some people who are called to minister to the broken, some people uh, to single-parent homes, to orphans, some people who are called to care for the elderly. You get the point. On and on we go. Whatever God has blessed you with, it's for His glory, and it's for you to use in your lifetime. God positions you in your life. Every step you take is God positioning you, and those positions are used for a very important focus, and that is to be a blessing. God has blessed us to be a blessing. God has blessed me to be a blessing. Can you say that with me? God has blessed me to be a blessing. As we continue this parable now, listen to what Luke 12, 19 through 20 says. The man is continuing his thought process in his head. He says, I'm going to build this, and I'm going to build that. I'm going to knock down what I have. I'm going to store more. Now, this is what he says. Um, then I'll say to myself, now he's still talking to himself, okay? That's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah, he's walking around the field and he's just talking, to, I'm going to build this and I'm going to build that. He's talking to himself. Now be careful when you do that. He says, uh, he says this to himself, uh, you have many goods stored up for many years. He, he's looking over his books right now. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these things unless it's ding-dongs or ring-dings, I guess, that you want to eat. Uh, but take it easy, eat, drink yourself. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with resting, with filling your body, with taking a drink if you're parched. There's nothing wrong with that. But notice again, God isn't mentioned anywhere in this equation. But then now, this is what God says here. You fool. Can you say that with me? Wait a minute, I thought it was Pastor Appreciation Day. You're calling me a fool? What's going on here? What no, I am a fool well, sometimes, and so are you. Uh, but you fool, you fool. Well, why is he a fool here? Listen to this. Night, your life is demanded of you. How about that? This man's making all these plans to build bigger and better, but God, who holds life and death in his hands, God, who knows every day, every second that's planned for every human being, God knows that tonight, this man's number is going to be called. He knows that this is the end for him. So take it easy. I'm going to eat, drink. But nowhere is prayer mentioned here. Nowhere is I got to get right with God. Nowhere is I'm going to help the poor. I'm going to help this one. I'm going to help that one. You know, we don't know if he has family. Um, but in those days, obviously, people had very large families. There's no mention of helping anybody. Certainly, he's got to have a friend or two, an employee if he has all this property and, and agriculture and and facility, uh, but no mention to help anybody. Not even an animal. He's got to have animals to take care of his field. He's not taking even take care of the animals. Nobody but himself, me, myself, and I, is his focus. And God says this, this very night, you fool, your life is going to be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? 
You're working so hard for all of this. But whose will they be? You might want to write this principle down. Never leave God out of my planning. Can you say that with me? Never leave God out of my planning. It's a tragic mistake to make. You don't want to leave God out of your planning. You want to be somebody who is constantly consulting God, looking to God. Every decision you make, this, is a, this will help you with more peace in your life. This will add more clarity to decisions you've got to make. It will also help talk you off edge like this man. This man is being extremely selfish right now in how he's acting and how he's thinking. You know, a lot of times we wonder, why did somebody act selfishly? It's because they're thinking selfishly. You know, your thinking is very important. You want to evaluate how you think. If our thoughts are always consumed on ourself and what I'm going to get, uh, we got to realize something. We're only beating ourselves. One of the principles to having success in any area of life, sports, business, education, is this. The first principle of winning is this. Don't defeat yourself, okay? You can't defeat yourself. This is a defeatist mentality because everything is me, everything is I, and he's leaving God out. Look what Proverbs 16.1 says in the Good News Translation. Why don't we say it together? We may make our plans, but God has the last word. Words to live by. God has the last word. What plans are you making now? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to have this, and I'm going to have that. Is that God's best? Is that what he wants you to do? Again, you don't want to be guilty of being greedy because what we say, you sow greed, you reap dissatisfaction and a lot of other things for that matter. Proverbs 28, 25 says it this way. Why don't we say it together? Greed causes fighting. Trusting God leads to prosperity. Greed will cause nothing but conflict in your life. It will put a wedge between you and other people. Have you ever noticed that? When maybe in a family somebody passes away, and there's money to be divided, uh-oh, look out. Family could get a little nutty. The fangs could come out. People, people could really go low when there's money involved. Mine, mine, mine. That is a mentality that we have sometimes. I told you a while ago, a long time ago, I hope you remember this illustration, but I'll tell it to you again. How many have ever seen Sesame Street? Remember that episode on Sesame Street when everybody had mine-itis? Everybody's walking around going, mine, 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 mine. Even the nice guy with the microphone was a guy smiling. He was walking around. Guy smiling was even doing it, right? Mine, 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 mine. And the only thing that cured mine-itis was that somebody had to give something. And then it slowly started to break mine-itis. you got to be careful not to come down with mine-itis. You're worried about other itises. Be concerned about getting mine-itis. Because mine-itis shows that you are planning your life without God. And it will put a wedge between you and other people. Greed will also put a wedge between you and God. You know, your fellowship with God is something you want to guard. That's how you want to think, my time with God. You know, when I think about, like, my family, I want to spend time with my family, and I'm going to guard that time. I have a practice in my life where I guard my time with God. I make sure that when I spend time with God, I turn the phone off. I make sure I go to a place where I could be quiet and learn from God. I also have developed the practice to have healthy thinking, to get alone, and to think. Let me suggest to you that you need to get a thinking spot, okay? Now, everybody has a worry spot. That's everywhere, right? We worry where we go. We're worried where we're working around. But you need to get a think spot. Now, what's a think spot? A think spot is a place you go to just settle down and think about God, think about your situation, and just to get away from it all, and then to jot some things down. Because we usually fix our problems and plan our life by the way we think. But that's not good enough. You need to ask God, the Spirit says, let the Spirit transform your thinking. We see things one way. You know what that one way is? Our way. When you get alone and get to your thinking spot, God, how do I need to see this? Sometimes you need to consult somebody else and get some wisdom and advice. How are you living your life right now? Is your life just you planning it to do your way? Let me go to work. Let me get what I got to get. Let me do this. Let me do that. Again, that's a formula for dissatisfaction. We want to be people who never leave God out. And so the first part of the verse says, 
Greed causes fighting. It causes fighting with other people, and it will cause a fight between you and God. But the next part, trust God. Say that again with me. Trusting God leads to prosperity. Now, this man, you would say, had it all, but did he really? This man is going to die in his all tense and purposes, sadly, and go into a Christless eternity. He doesn't have it all. He might be wealthy in the world standards, but how is that going to help him for eternity? It's not. All the money in the world can't buy you eternal life. Can't do it. You never want to plan your life without God because it will lead to tremendous dissatisfaction here. And if you've never asked Christ into your life, oh boy, wait till you see this dissatisfaction of a Christless eternity. Never leave God out of your planning. Consult God with whatever you do. Don't tell, you can build bigger and better, but is that God's best? You can store up this and store that, but is there a greater place to store? Well, it goes on to say this. Look what it says now as we continue on here. Write this last principle down. Focus on having real prosperity. Can you say that with me? Focus on having real prosperity. Because there's a fake prosperity and a real prosperity. The fake prosperity is things. The real prosperity is Christ. I know, again, there's a lot of top-selling books that teach about getting and prosperity of material stuff. But what we must realize, I've said for years and years and years, God is far more interested in your soul prospering than your bank account or your bonds or your crops. God wants your soul to prosper. So focus on having real prosperity. Where are you at with God right now? Now it goes on to say this in verse 21 as we button up this parable. That's how it is with the one who stores up treasures for himself. So the one who stores up treasures for himself, he actually is very poor. And notice this, and is not rich toward God. Now, what is the currency of heaven? Does anybody know that? What's the currency of heaven then? Man, look at this guy. Who's richer than this guy? And the Bible labels him poor? What's the currency of heaven? You ready for it? It also starts with an M. It's not money. It's what? It's mercy. We're told that God, who is rich in what? Mercy. God has lavished his mercy upon us. It's only by his mercy that we could get to grace. It's only by his mercy that we could possibly understand his unconditional love. It all starts with mercy. God, it chooses to be merciful to you and I. Uh, there should be a devotion that's coming out this week, and you'll see it. If you don't get our devotion, you could subscribe to it. It's right on the app. It's in the email. But God will never run out of mercy. I hope you, I hope you believe that. He will never run out of mercy. The Bible says that his mercy endureth forevermore. You can never exhaust the patience and mercy of God. It will never run out. In fact, every day you draw breath, the Bible says there's new mercies. There's new mercies. His mercies renew every day. And then what does it say? Great is thy faithfulness. The greatest sign of God's faithfulness is not money. It's his mercy. By far. The Bible makes that very clear. And you and I want to understand the currency of heaven is mercy. That if I'm going to be labeled rich, I'm going to have to be a person that understands mercy and obviously is also showing mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown more mercy. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. But notice where we're to store up our treasures. Because if God does bless you with finances, with talents, with your time, God doesn't want you to use it for yourself because real prosperity is in the soul. He wants you to give it back. Notice what it says here in Matthew 6, 19 through 20. This is the complete opposite of what this rich fool did, okay? And I'm not calling him a fool. God did, okay? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. And throw in mosquitoes there because mosquitoes are annoying too. But where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves, the rest of it was cut off for yourselves, treasures in heaven. Now, this was cut off. I wonder if that's because we forget that last part sometimes. I really do. You know, sometimes we forget that. We're living for here. we got to live for heaven. You've heard the saying of a nest egg, right? You ever hear that saying? I'm, I'm storing up for a nest egg. 
it's good to have a nest egg. A nest egg is something that you use and maybe you tap for something, a need or a trip or whatever like that. It's good to have a nest egg. It's also great to have a heavenly nest egg. And you want to you wanna be investing in heaven. You want to be generous. God has blessed you to be generous. Now, here's the great thing about God. You can never outgive God. You give God your time, he will replenish you and re-energize and bless you. You give God your faithful giving, God will bless that. And he, he, he will bless that in a great way. You give God your talent. You ever notice when you help people, even though you're blessing somebody else, you're getting blessed while you're blessing others? That's how God works. That's God's economy. That's how God does things. Because the focus is on real prosperity. God doesn't want us getting caught up storing things. I heard the story about a man who had incredible corn. He had award-winning corn in his field. And they asked him the secret to his success. And listen to the secret to his success. He would give the same seeds and the same practices to his farmers who were on the neighboring farms. And when asked about that, they said, well, why do you do that? And he talked about the winds of cross-pollination. He talked about how uh, when, when it's blowing and swirling and the pollen's going, that if they had unhealthy corn, it would affect his corn. And then he wouldn't have great corn. My friends, life is the same way. If you're just worried about growing your corn and you're not worried about everybody else and concerned about everybody else, it's eventually going to affect your corn. Uh, if you're just selfish with your time and you're not concerned about using it for God, it will make your time very unproductive and very unfulfilled. If you're just concerned about your bottom line and your money, guess what? All the money in the world will never satisfy you. Never. Never. And so God wants us to focus on having real prosperity. You know, over the years, I've had the privilege, and I call it a privilege, to be at the bedside of people passing. And I've never heard anybody in all the years of doing this now. And, and here, pastor of this church for 17 years and in ministry prior to that, over 22 years of visiting, preaching, a funeral, whatever it might be, I have never heard one person say on their deathbed, Pastor, go to the bank and get my records. Nobody ever said that to me. I mean, nobody, no, not one person. There's been a lot. Not one. Not one person. Now, maybe their family was thinking that, but not the person. See, what matters most is your soul. If you want real satisfaction in this life, the story of the rich young fool is not a financial parable to how to earn more money or how to be more likable as some people teach. No, the parable of the rich young fool says beware of greed because you'll hurt yourself in this life and if you don't know Christ, you will cost yourself eternity. And Jesus said it this way. Look what Matthew 16, 26 says. Why don't we say it together? And what if you but is worth than your no, absolutely not. Nothing is worth your soul. You trading in. You might be saying, but don't I got to trade something in for my soul? Well, good news. Something's already been traded in for your soul. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God. See, he's a rich fool because he don't know that. He don't believe in uh, the teachings of the Old Testament. He's so concerned about his external prosperity. He's now focused on his eternal prosperity. Something's already been traded in. It's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless Lamb of God who went to the cross for you and I. And so I ask you the question as Jesus asks, I ask it of myself, you know, what good is it if you gain the whole world? Now here's the thing. Nobody is gaining the whole world. But there are people willing to trade in their soul for a little bit of the world's riches. How crazy is that? Jesus said, look at this, what good is it if you gain the whole world? Nobody's gaining the whole world. And so that begs the question of you today. Why are you giving up the riches of heaven and the riches in this life of walking with the peace of God if you already know Christ for just a little bit of the world. God has called you and I to focus on eternity. See, my friends, when we sow greed, we will be very dissatisfied with who we are and life in general. There's not enough money in the world. There's not enough pleasures in this world 
to give you the peace that Almighty God could give. What we reap is what we sow. Sow generosity, and you will always reap satisfaction. Sow sacrifice, and you will always reap significance. Sow, sow, sow obedience to God in this area, and you will always reap the wind of heaven. What's the wind of heaven? The wind of heaven is God's approval, the wind in your sail. You know, it's hard to steer a ship with a sail if you don't got the wind. You need the wind of God. Some of us today, as we close right now, we're wondering why. Why isn't there movement here? Why isn't there movement here in my life? What? Well, you know what it is? From a fellow sinner, I can tell you what it is. It's because our focus is off sometimes. We're focused on earthly matters. We need to set our mind on the things above, we're told in Colossians. We need to set our mind and our attention on the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. My friends, I pray today that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's a heaven and there's a hell. You don't want to be, even with all the things the rich fool had, you don't want to be with the rich fool. You want to be somebody, whether you have money or not, whether you have a lot of talents, a little talent, whatever it is, whatever it is, you want to know without a shadow of a doubt that if my life ended today, my life was demanded of me today, I would wake up in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know that today, praise God. And live your life that way. Sow this belief in your heart that it's all about God. I'm blessed to be a blessing. This parable was left for you and I. It's relevant today as it was then. Even if we don't have crops and farms, God wants us to take this to heart. He doesn't want us to meander in the maze of mediocrity. He doesn't want us to get lost down the path of false prosperity. God does not want us to get lost in this life. Rather, he wants us to hold on to the true riches of heaven, which are his mercy, and spend every day he gives us thereafter, living for his glory, for those are the seeds we want to sow. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's pray together. With all our heads bowed and eyes closed, um, if you felt like coming in here today, man, I was the rich young fool. I may not be as rich as him, but just take away the rich part. I've been a fool, and I've been trusting in myself and pleasure. I've been making choices about my life that don't include God. Well, welcome to the club. Everybody's done that. And you might be thinking, I'm too far from God. Well, you are too far from God, and that's why he sent his son. And so if you've never asked Christ into your heart, tomorrow is not promised to you. This evening is not even promised to you. Open your heart to Christ. Say this prayer right now, wherever you are right now. Uh, even if you're at home right now, in the quietness of your own heart, just say these, these words to God. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent of my ways. Forgive me. I ask your son Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. With all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you pray that prayer, we'd love to hear about that. Come seek us out after service. Let me just pray for all of us now. Why don't we stand uh, as we close in prayer, and then we're going to have our last song of dedication today. Let us pray together. Our Father, our God, as we get ready to sing this last song, uh, we want it to be a declaration, a commitment to you. Just as the heavy rains came today, O oh God, uh, we want you to rain down blessing on us, but we don't want to be a selfish people. We want to be a people who are committed to you all the days of our life. No longer do we want to feel the, the uneasiness, the separation that comes from dissatisfaction. We want to be a people who are sowing the seeds you want us to sow. And so we commit our hearts to you once more. We thank you for the cross 
and for the mercy that you've shown to us. Help us to be focused like a laser beam on these facts of the scripture, O oh God. For that will yield the peace we need in this life. And one day we will enjoy We will enjoy the perfect peace of being in heaven. But until then, O oh God, remind us each and every day that we've been blessed to be a blessing. Lord, I pray for everybody that's here today, all of us who have gotten second chances, third chances, a hundred chances, that you have set us free from our prisons, you have set us free from the strongholds in our life, and you have not taken us from the gutter to be selfish. You have called us to be a people, O oh God, who are reflective and responsive to your mercy. Let that be said of this church, this day, and every day. May we be a grateful people for what you have done. We commit this before you, and we sow these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said,